you guys have been filmed before. Okay. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here tonight. So the topic for this evening is the creed. And before we start, before we get into it, I'll give you a nice outline of where we're going to go. Uh, but let's just go ahead and start in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord our God, we give you thanks. Thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of creating us and for redeeming us through the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit upon us in this class, open our minds to understand your truth, and inflame our hearts with the love of you. Blessed Mary, our Mother, we fly to your patronage. Please protect us and lead us to love your Son. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Great. So as I said, the topic for this evening is the creed. Uh, first off, just a really simple definition of the creed. The creed uh, is a collection. So the word creed comes from the Latin word credo, uh, I believe. And so that's actually the first word of the creed that you have in front of you is I believe. In Latin credo is where we get the word creed. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about before we talk about the creed itself is actually uh, faith, that first word, belief, faith. So we'll do a little bit on faith, which will help us to understand uh, why the creed is so important. And I wanted to spend a moment on faith, particularly because we live uh, at an, in an age when faith is very much under attack, that uh, many people who claim to be highly educated will say it's not an intelligent thing to do to have faith, right? If you have faith, um, you, couldn't, you can't be a reasoning person that these two are opposed. Uh, we hear this often. It's kind of been a popular idea for the last few centuries. So what I want to do is just briefly define faith, and in doing that show how it's actually not unreasonable, but, but very reasonable to have faith. So the best way to understand what we mean by faith is actually to compare it uh, between two other uh, acts of the intellect. So the first thing, angle this a little bit, um, that we have is knowledge. Right? So knowledge would be when we have a natural and immediate understanding of something. Right? So if I so the, what we sense through our senses and is an example of this, right? If I am touching the podium here, then I have knowledge of the physical presence of this podium, right? I can't possibly deny that. It's natural and spontaneously apparent to me, right? I can't, can't deny it. That's knowledge. Um, so that we would say it's when um, the object, the thing that I'm knowing is seen. That's knowledge. So if something's seen, that's knowledge, but it could be not just physical knowledge, right, but also in the abstract. Like if we think about in math, if I know 2 plus 2 equals 4, then 2, 4, you know, it's not a, it's just another step. I didn't know 2, 2 plus 4 equals 6, right? I could have a knowledge of that in the same way that I just see that 2 plus 2 plus 2 equals 6, right? It's, uh, it's like sight in that it's just immediately apparent. Does that make sense? Um, so that would be the first thing, knowledge. Um, and then on the other end, when something isn't seen, like in knowledge, um, when the object is unseen, um, even though there's not some, even though the object isn't seen, one can choose to um, form a judgment or form an opinion about something, right? Um, so, for example, uh, I don't, um, let's see. We could like think of our maybe our political opinions in this in this realm, right? There could be disagreeing. People have different um, ways of thinking about it because precisely the object isn't seen, right? It's unclear, and so that people can fall on either either direction. Um, and opinion specifically would be when the object is unseen um, and there's equal evidence on both sides, right? So if someone were to tell me, um, someone were to tell me that. Uh, sorry, I'm struggling to think of an example here. What would be an example of opinion? Um, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll come back. So the, the difference then, where we'll, we'll situate faith is, in, is the middle, 
between these two extremes. So unlike knowledge, um, faith's object is still not seen. There's not that direct knowing. Um, so it's like opinion in that the object isn't seen in faith. Uh, but the difference between faith and opinion is in the realm of faith, we have um, strong evidence that what we don't see is to be believed. Right? So we could say we have credible evidence. So the reason I was struggling to think of an example earlier, I was struggling to think of something where we wouldn't have credible evidence, right? So, but that's the, the difference between the two. So this is just all on the natural level, right? We're not talking about um, uh, divine faith yet, just on the natural human level, we have knowledge, opinion, and faith. And so even just in, the, in our human life, there's lots of things we have human faith for. For example, your birthday, you actually don't have <laughs> knowledge of, but you believe that on the testimony of your parents or whoever else has told you that, right? And But you believe that very reasonably. It would be crazy to not believe your parents about the date of your birth. Um, or another great example we could think of, um, has anyone ever been to England here? Um, Deacon, no. Uh, what about India? Anyone ever been to India? No, okay. So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, none of us have been to India. But none of us doubt the existence of India, right? None of us have experienced directly India, um, but we very reasonably believe in its existence and maybe its, you know, the number of its population and its history. Um, so we have a human faith about where India is, um, and that's that's a good thing. It's a reasonable thing to have this faith because even though we don't see India, we have credible evidence of its existence. So does that make sense? Kind of those three. Um, so. To the person who says, you know, you Catholics, you believe all types of things, and you, that's, that means you're not re, uh, intellectual because you believe. You could say, you're crazy. We believe all types of things very reasonably. Um, and so then, just as there's human faith, um, what then makes this more than just a human, quality of human life? It's when that object that we can't see is God or something to do with God. Right? So that would be then uh, divine faith. Right, if the, the unseen object is God himself, or something that something else that God has revealed about himself. Um, and so then someone could ask the question, okay, you've got all, all these different religions who believe all these, right, these different things, and, and they all claim to be about God. Um, how do you know that your faith in God is legitimate, right? Um, and so then we, we need credible evidence, right, for our faith to be reasonable. Uh, and this would be a, a whole class on itself for me to just talk about what, why our faith is the most reasonable, but um, just two broad topics or categories are miracles and prophecy. So sometime, maybe I'll come back for another one and we can talk about all the different miracles and prophecy that are credible evidence that um, the Judeo-Christian revelation is, the credible, is a credible revelation that is to be believed. So um, that's just kind of the introduction on faith. Any questions on that before we move forward? Awesome. Um, yeah, so don't let anyone tell you that you're not reasonable for believing, because it's, um, and particularly when we're talking about divine faith, um, if it's God himself who's witnessing to something, God is truth himself, he can't lie. So it's, it's actually the most reasonable thing to believe God who is, who is truth. Um, so I guess one other kind of preliminary note. So we're talking about the creed. Um, the creed, as you can see, is a list just kind of, of, of propositions of things that uh, must be believed, right, or things that we believe as Catholics. Uh, and so someone might, again, maybe a modern objection would be, do we really need a creed, right? We maybe can think of some figures in pop culture saying, like, oh, wouldn't it be just great if there was no creeds, right? Like, we could just get rid of all religious distinctions, right? We hear things like this sometimes. Um, right? People, it's like, can, creed can be used as a bad thing. We hear this sometimes in pop, pop culture, that creed is a bad thing. It's got kind of a stigma around it. Um, so I'll just want to briefly, before we get into the content of the creed, say a few things about why it's necessary for um, to have a creed and why we should be so thankful for this gift of the, the creed that we have here in front of us. Uh, so to answer that question, why is it necessary? 
Uh, first, just yeah, to return to some basics of theology, but I, again, I think there, this will help set the stage really well. We think about if we think about what um, God's plan is for all of our lives, right? That God wants to unite all of us to Himself in love, right? He wants um, us to go to be in heaven with Him, right? But and what that that is when we're in heaven someday, God willing, is God has raised up our human nature to be like him, right, to be like his divinity, um, and to be in a relationship of eternal love with him. Right, so really, that's, that's the goal. It's crazy to think about. We're just little human beings, but God who created everything wants to raise us up into a relationship of love with him. And that's why he's revealed himself, and that's why he became man. Um, and so if the goal is to be in a relationship of love with God, just like in, in any other part of life, we can't have love without first having knowledge, without first knowing someone, right? So if I were, if someone were to claim that they're in love with this person and they're going to marry them, but they've, they've never met them, right? We'd say, you're crazy, you're not in love with that person, right? Or, um, clearly, it's, we experience that when we're, we're falling in love, it's really deepening the knowledge, right? That the depth of knowledge. Uh, when, as knowledge increases, love can then increase. So in the same way, in our relationship with God, the goal is to love him. We could never reach that goal without having knowledge of him. And that's why, in his goodness, he, God reveals himself to humanity. Um, and so we see that through, since ancient times, through the, through the prophets in the Jewish religion, um, and then ultimately in becoming man, in his son, Jesus Christ. Um, and yeah, so just a few a few things about that, right? So God isn't seen by us, right? We don't see him directly, but he wants to be known. So he reveals himself, again, through these through these ways that um, by inspiring the scriptures, by ins inspiring men and women to, to speak of him. Um, and not, so he reveals himself in these ways, and then he gives us the grace of faith. Really, faith is a, a gift to be able to... Um, for our little intellects to grab on to what he's revealed. So he reveals things about himself, he inspires us to be able to say yes to that, uh, and then he makes, he also takes what he's revealed, right, through holy men and women who have spoken, and he gives means of preserving what he's spoken so that it can be carried on through the ages for more people to be able to um, see and believe, right? So, what I mean specifically about that, when we, we'll take, let's take specifically the example of um, our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So he became man um, in 0 AD, right, about 2,000 years ago, um, and he spoke, um, he taught many things as he went through Galilee and Judea, right? Um, but he didn't just say those things and say, oh, I hope you, I hope you heard everything okay, right? You know, I'm, gonna, I'm going back up to heaven, but... Like, Hopefully you hold on to all of that, right? But he took 12 men and gave them a particular gift to be that those 12 men and their successors would hold faithfully on to what he taught throughout all time, right? So that's why we see in Matthew 16 when um, Jesus says to St. Peter, the prince of the apostles, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld will not prevail against it, right? So... Hell will never overcome the church. Christ has given to the apostles, to St. Peter and the other apostles, the gift of always holding true to the faith that he revealed. Um, so we call this infallibility, right? That there, there's a, God has promised to the Catholic Church to all, that it will always hold to what he's revealed to us in Christ. Um, and he's also inspired, right, the Bible. So the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit so that it's um, everything in it is without error, um, but we see that <laughs> we being weak human beings can maybe read this and misunderstand it, right? Um, think about how many different Protestant denominations we have, right? like tens, tens of thousands. Uh, and so we see that just having the Bible wouldn't be enough for us to, to really have certain knowledge of God. And that's again why we have the church as a faithful um, transmitter of what God has spoken and written in the Bible. So that's so that's 
since this can be interpreted in a number of ways, right, we need the church to um, continue to interpret and clarify what it is that God has said. And that's why we get things like the, the creed that you have in front of you, right? It takes, um, it's really a synthesis of everything we see revealed in the Bible. That's a really beautiful way to look at it. Look at it. It's kind of taking everything that God tells through these beautiful stories and allegories and uh, metaphors, and the creed is really synthesizing everything to, okay, what's, what, are, what's, what are the foundations that we need to have? Um, so we should be really thankful that that hard work has been done for us and it's all uh, right here, but then reading the scriptures is obviously still very valuable. So the creed is necessary as a way of knowing that we're holding on to what God has spoken. That's the that main point there. Um, and then lastly, one other thing about the necessity of the creed. So at the beginning, I mentioned some people think, you know, creeds, they're, that's a bad thing. That's a sign of division, that we have different creeds. Um, but I would, just to propose to you to think of creed as a, actually a sign of unity. Um, so we see the way that God has uh, acted with human beings is he reveals himself, and in doing that, he calls people together. He's been doing that since the beginning of time. With the Jewish people, he reveals himself through Moses, and he gathers the people to himself. Um, and so the same with Christ and his church. He reveals himself in Christ, and he gathers a church to himself. Um, so again, maybe people might think, oh, saying, I believe this, I believe this, that's division. But to think about the marvel that there's over a billion Catholics in the world. Like, what, <laughs> what other, um, with, from every culture and every country and all, I mean, it's incredible, this, this, this unity, unity that comes from the creed. Um, so again, if someone tells you that creeds are something divisive, don't say, don't believe that. That's crazy. It's um, God calling people to himself, bringing them together in the unity of a family. But there needs to be a common belief for that to happen. Otherwise, it's just, we could say, it, oh, we have unity, but if there's not um, really something in common, then that's just saying something, right? So, questions on that? We'll go into more some of the history and the specifics of the creed we have in front of us. Um, so, firstly, there might be some confusion. Um, there, yeah, so there's actually, we've maybe heard the terms Apostles' Creed and Nicene Creed, perhaps. Um, so there's two versions. There's actually a number of different versions of the creed that um, different church councils have put out throughout the, the centuries, but kind of the two you hear about the most are those two, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. So I'll go ahead and write that Nicene. Um, since that, that's not an everyday word. Um, so the version you have in front of you is the Nicene Creed. Um, the Apostles' Creed is shorter, it's uh, more abridged, and it's more ancient as well. So the Apostles' Creed is obviously named after the 12 Apostles, um, and it very likely may come from as early as the Apostles themselves, um, or their immediate successors. Um, but what we know with certainty is from history is that it existed prior to the third century in Rome, right? So St. Ambrose in the 300s tells us, already at his time, it's an ancient practice that the Apostles' Creed was used in the city of Rome um, during their baptisms. So the Apostles' Creed is earlier than the 300, right? So very, very early. Um, and again, someone in the 300s is calling it ancient, so it's, it's, it's old. <laughs> um, this longer creed that we have, slightly newer, um, is from the year 325. So this creed comes after the Council of Nicaea, which was a calling of all the bishops throughout the whole world at the time, so the Mediterranean region, uh, essentially, that had been converted to Catholicism. Um, a calling together of the bishops to uh, discuss some <laughs> theological contentions that had, had, had arisen, right? So they were um, wanting to clarify what God has, has revealed in the face of a certain group of of men who had um, brought up some false beliefs, right? So we call these, um, the false belief is called a heresy, right? Something that's um, not true, a, a wrong uh, way of looking at the faith. Um, those who hold on to heresy are called heretics. Um, and this particular heresy of that time was um, led by a man named Arius. And so Arianism is the heresy. Um, so what, I'll mention that now, but what we'll kind of do is we, as we go through the creed, um, if you move from the shorter Apostles' Creed to the longer Nicene Creed, it kind of shows the things that had to be clarified against Arius and what he believed. But again, we'll, we'll get there if that's getting ahead a little bit. Uh, 
Yeah, so I think that's any questions on two, two creeds? No? Wonderful. So, okay, we're going to get to the, the thick stuff now. <laughs> so, the first thing to note is when we look at the creed you have in front of, we have in front of us, um, we can learn a lot from just its uh, the bare bones structure of it. So if we look at it together, um, the first paragraph, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. The second paragraph, I believe in the one Lord Jesus Christ. And then starting, it's actually the fourth paragraph on our sheet, but I believe in the Holy Spirit. So really, if you look at that, those bones there, the, the biggest affirmation we have from this creed is the Trinity. Right? We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's kind of the whole outline of the creed is the Trinity. Um, so if I'm remembering correctly, there you had a class on the Trinity. First, or at the very beginning, is that, is that right? A long time ago? First semester. First semester. <laughs> <laughs> You've already had your finals on this. You forgot the fall semester. Fall semester. I don't remember anything from fall semester. Um, so if it's okay, I thought we could go over back over the Trinity a little bit, um, since it's kind of super important right at, right at the, the, the base. And again, I mean, here we're talking about God revealing himself in mysteries, so we could, <laughs> could go over this every day of the week and, and not get old. Um, so does anyone want to take a stab at explaining the Trinity? The, the basics of the, what the Trinity is? It's okay, that's, a, that's actually unexpected that no one would want to. Um, okay, what about, let's do this. When we, the most, <laughs> The best way is that our tradition has handed down to us to talk about the Trinity without falling into some uh, wrongful way of talking about it is to use these two terms. Um, so we'll get some lines here. Um, person and nature. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Somewhat. Okay. Um, anyone want to take a stab at the difference between the two? It's okay. That's all right. So again, this is going to be an example of doing a little bit of philosophy, but then which actually ends up helping a lot with uh, the theology. So uh, I think it's worth it. We can suffer the philosophy for a moment. So um, these are two terms that actually come from ancient philosophy. Um, perhaps easier to define first would be nature, right? So when you're talking about a nature, we simply mean what something is, right? So we're all human beings. We have human nature, right? Just kind of the, the common way of using the word. Um, so then, but specifically, just when we think nature, you can think what, right? The, what is the the whatness of the thing? What what type of thing is it? That answers the question of nature. Um, and then, very simply, person as well. When we um, speak of someone's person, what we're speaking of is who someone is, right? So, um, if you were to ask me what I am, I would answer I'm a human being. But if you were to ask me, so nature. If you ask me who I am, I would say I'm Dan, right? That's so we can see the difference between a question of personhood and a question of nature. Um, so in our natural experience uh, here on Earth, there's always a one-to-one -one ratio, right? I'm one person and I have one human nature, right? That's our, that's our common experience. Um, but it's important to note that that's actually um, not the case by what we would call a logical necessity, right? Um, it's the norm that there's a one person, one nature relationship, um, but it's actually not strictly illogical to have one for that to not be in a one-to-one -one ratio, right? Um, it's strictly against logic to have, um, right? Right, so the principle we're getting at here is what we call the principle of non-contradiction, that something can't be and not be at the same time in the same way, right? So I can't be um, a human being and a, a dog because to be a dog means I'm not a human being, right? Um, or I can't be here and there simultaneously, right? Um, but there's, since the person is answering the question of who and the na nature is answering the question of what, um, they're not logically opposed necessarily. Does that, does that make sense? That's so little... are, are you saying the, the nature of the Holy Trinity is the Holy Spirit, God, and the 
Son, and then the person is God. Or the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the nature, and the person is God. You're point to the flipping. 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 You're, you're right there. Yes, yeah, you're right there. <laughs> so the, yeah, that's perfect. So the nature would be what, right? And so we would say the divinity, right? God. Um, the nature is absolute perfection, right? Fullness of being. Um, goodness itself. All of these things would be talking about what God's nature is, right? So just for complete perfection, right? Um, would be answering the question of the nature of God. Um, and then the question of personhood is speak points to the individuals, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So in the Trinity, we have one nature, the divinity, and three persons, right? Three persons sharing one nature. And so the reason why, um, so I guess just to stop on the, the nature for one second, we have... When we speak about the divine nature, right, absolute perfection, when we talk about absolute perfection, there couldn't possibly be two absolute perfections, right? Because um, to have two absolutely perfect things would mean that, well, they're not, each of them isn't absolutely perfect because one would lack what the other has, right? Um, so the fact that God's nature is complete perfection means there can only be one of him, right? One God. So that's why we're, <laughs> we're strict monotheists, right? We're, <laughs> we're not... Um, just because there's three persons in the Trinity doesn't mean there's three gods, right? The, his perfection means there's only one of him. Um, but the distinction that we have with the persons, right? So the three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, are distinguished by their relationships to each other. Right? So that might sound a little strange. What I mean by that is the only thing that the Father has, as talking about God is kind of words can be difficult here, that the Son doesn't have is his fatherhood of the Son, right? In every other way, they're the same. They're perfect God, they're fullness of being, they're unchangeable, immortal, right? They're both, they share all those things. Those are all nature. Um, but the Father is Father of the Son, and the Son is not Son of the Father, obviously, right? So they're only distinguished by the, the difference of relationship to each other, right? Um, so, and then the relationships would be, we have the relationship of paternity from the father to the son, right? The son has a relationship of sonship from the son to the father. And the Holy Spirit um, has a relationship with both the father and the son um, as the love proceeding from the two of them, between the two of them. So we'll, I'll get to, actually we'll, right now I'll do a little example to get to kind of clear that up a little bit. But basics of nature and person and how that works in paternity, any questions? Great. So there's a really... Um, amazing way of uh, explaining this, which is one of my favorite things to do, because it's absolutely, it's one of the things where we can just look at how God has revealed himself and just be amazed. Like, wow, this is <laughs> um, so cool. So, um, St. Augustine in the 300s, um, through, sorry, 400s, through reflecting on what we know of the Trinity from the Bible, and trying to make sense of it, um, to be able to teach people, um, realized that in the way our human mind works is actually an image, um, we'll, we'll explain it, but it can be an image of the life of the Trinity. So, and, and that's actually not surprising, right? If we're trying to look for um, ways of explaining this, it's not surprising that the best way of explaining it we would find in ourselves because we're um, closest to God insofar as um, being made in his image and likeness, right? Um, so it's not surprising that we find an image of him in us, um, but the way Augustine explains it, I'll just briefly go over for you, it's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> so he starts from what we get in the first chapter of St. John's Gospel, which is, in the beginning was the Word, right? and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Um, and then John goes on to say, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? So he's talking about um, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, becoming man, right? Um, but Augustine stops to think, he's like, why did God choose the word word, right, to reveal himself? What is that saying about God? Um, and then, so again, he's thinking about us and thinking about the Trinity, and he realizes um, that the relationship of father to son is similar to the way that our mind forms a concept, right? If we think about, um, from my intellect, I can form an idea 
which is in a way born from my mind, right? Um, so like, I, if I if I think about dog, right, dog becomes something that's uh, real, right? Something in a way separate, right? Um, it's it's still part of me, um, but there can be that I can make that distinction of the thing that I'm thinking about, right? Now in the divine mind, right, God's perfect mind. Um, if he were to have a concept, if God were to have a concept, um, that thing would also be God, right? Is the thing that he thinks would also be God because it's perfect, right? So the divine mind, the Father, um, has a concept, a word, right? Concept equal word, which is the Son. So the Son is that thought which the Father thinks from all eternity, right? So the Father's first in a sense, but they're both equally eternal, right? Not, no, neither was before the other. Um, and so, sim so it, does that first step make sense so far? Um, and then similarly, like, welcome, Daniel and Pat, by the way, sorry for not <laughs> saying hi when you walked in. Um, yeah, we, he doesn't get off the port till seven. No, it's great, you can come, come in whatever, we're, we're glad you're here. Um, and so, similarly again, pointing, going back to the human uh, mind, when, um, so I, something is known, uh, when I know something, again, I said earlier, then I can make the act of my will to love it, right? So if I, um, maybe, let's say I form the idea of, I form the idea of having dinner, and then I make the resolution to go eat dinner, right? Then that's the act of my will to pursue that thing that I thought about. Um, or, you know, better a better example would be, I have, I'm thinking of the person, um, my family member who I, who I know, and then I, I also have a love for that person, right? Um, and I know Lisa, you've got to go too, so don't don't feel bad. No, you're, you're you <laughs> we, bad. we understand. Bad. We understand. Well, um, it's, it's being recorded, so you can you can go watch it. <laughs> um, and we hope you feel better. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good night. Good night. Um, so, in the same thing, in the divine, uh, in the Trinity, right? That concept which the divine mind thinks from all eternity. Um, it also loves because that concept is perfect and good, right? So um, there's then a love between the Father and the Son, which is itself also a person, right? The Holy Spirit. So just like in our mind, we have a concept, a word formed, and we're able to then uh, make an act of love towards that thing. So in the divine mind, we have, so in God, we have the divine mind forming a concept and then love existing between the mind and the word, right? And so that's that's any way of explaining the Trinity. Does that does that make sense? Um, and so yeah, again, this is a, this is <laughs> this is deep stuff. This is stuff we could literally spend the rest of our life contemplating. Um, but what is so amazing here is that when we just to think about that the very inner life of God is love. To think about to think about that that, that that's amazing that. We're, we're made to enter into God's life. He says he wants to raise us into our, his life. And what he is from all eternity is this relationship of love. Father to son, son to father, Holy Spirit being that love between the two of them. So, yeah, I think that's incredible to think about. Um, and so now going back to the creed, which is in front of you, what's amazing here is that we see all of that affirmed already in the first uh, what? Let's see, eight words here. Um, so I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. So one God, word one, that's, we're getting the affirmation of nature. But then the Father Almighty, we're having a statement made about person. So it's, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Like already we're, we're getting to <laughs> so much richness just there. So the going back a little bit, uh, we, I mentioned earlier this name, Arius, who was a man who lived in the 300s, um, who had some wrong ideas that needed to be corrected. <laughs> so essentially what he thought is he, he really struggled with this idea of the Trinity, right? Thinking three persons in one nature. Um, and particularly, yeah, he's, again, he thought, well, if God's absolutely perfect, there can only be one, and that means the Father, he's the perfect one, and, every, and the Son of the Holy Spirit would be lower than the Father. That was... Arius' idea of it. So the Son is not God, um, but like half God or kind of divine, right? So he was 
basically yeah, like Hercules or something. Like Hercules, exactly. Yeah. Um, so he was going around, and it was mass massively popular. He was going around making up little like uh, catchy songs in Greek and convincing all of people about this. Um, so it was a really uh, tragic thing that was happening. The council gets called to settle this, um, and really to, to refute this. Um, and so what we see then when we look at the paragraph on the second paragraph on Christ. Um, could we get oh, are these extra ones right here? Yeah, there's two extra ones. Four or five inches. And if you want that way, you can follow along easier. Uh, so when we look at the second paragraph about Christ, um, we'll see I, so much of this is um, aimed at refuting this error, right? So um, perhaps you've wondered why we say God from God, light from light, true God from true God. It sounds kind of repetitive, right? Um, but that's because it, it is repetitive and it has Arius in mind. It's, it's drilling against him. You have God the Son from God the Father. Perfect light from perfect light. And in case you didn't get it the first time, he's really God <laughs> from true God. True God from true God. Um, and then a few other things pointing to the equality of the Son and the Father. Um, firstly, if we go back to the first line of that second paragraph, that word Lord is something we can tend to just pass over. We think, oh, you have Lord, like a king, you know, oh, you, know, you have a Lord. Um, but in, in the biblical language, this is a really, really significant word, Lord. Um, so we go back to the time of the Old Testament. God revealed his name, his holy name to Moses, the burning bush. Um, but the Jews treated this as so sacred that they wouldn't pronounce it. They would not say God's name. It was so holy. Um, and so they, they have all types of crazy things they did with their letters. So as to they would write it, but then they would never pronounce it. So they kind of smushed two words together so that you know, the, you know what it is, but you know not to say it. Um, but essentially, they would use this word in Hebrew, Adonai, right, Lord, in, in place of the name of God. Um, so that's why in our Bible, sometimes you'll see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It's in place of the divine name. Um, so that word Lord is really, really significant. It's saying the holiest name of God himself, right? It's a substitute for it. So when we see the, the Lord Jesus Christ, that's another really um, strong affirmation. It's saying he can't be less than God the Father. He's Lord just as God the Father is Lord. Uh, and then lastly, another really, really significant part of this passage, um, that second paragraph, is the word consubstantial, uh, which again is something we can tend to just pass over and think, well, wow, <laughs> couldn't they have picked a simpler word? What does that, what does that mean? Um, and this, I, for, that was the most controversial word in this whole, this whole creed, was approving this. Because these, this group uh, that followed Arius, they were fine saying, um, Oh, you know, the son is, he's like the father, or he's, he's so very, very close to being like the father, he's just not exactly the same, right? So they're really, really tricky with their words. So, but this word, consubstantial, literally means the same substance, right? Con, substantial. So they're, they are no way different in regards to nature, nature being substance, right? Um, they're the same substance. So um, that word itself is a really strong affirmation as well. So, any questions on why Arius is wrong or the second <laughs> paragraph of the creed? Uh, cool. One other thing I just want you to note as we kind of work through this together is there's a, a, a beautiful interplay as we recite it between um, speaking about God in himself, right? God in, um, as he is and has been from all eternity. And then the paragraphs will start kind of with that and then move to what God has done for, for us, right? So. Look at the paragraph of the Father. Um, one God, the Father Almighty, who made heaven and earth. Second paragraph. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the, or sorry, or yeah, the only begotten Son of God, born in the Father for all ages, da, 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 da. and then for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. Right? So there's this, we'll speak about who God is in himself, and then we'll speak about what he's done for us. And we see the same with the Holy Spirit, too. Um, just a, a helpful way of looking at the structure of the creed. Okay. So now we'll jump into, we're doing great all the time, good. Um, the second biggest um, part, so the first biggest affirmation of the creed, we see it in the way it's divided into those three sections, um, is the Trinity. Um, now, the second most important thing, if you had to guess what that would be, that the creed wants to drill into our heads, what would, what would you think? 
It would uh, be. This is dying and rising. Yeah, exactly. So it the seems like um, like first paragraph is basically like the opening part of John, and then the rest of it is his biography. Exactly, and maybe it's something that would help would be if you think about what's the point in mass, and it actually says it there, so you can look at the, look on the sheet <laughs> and cheat. But when do we bow and or kneel? Incarnate the Virgin Mary and became man. Exactly. So the second most important thing, which we'll we'll get into here, and I believe this was your second class <laughs> from the beginning of the year, um, is this big word, the incarnation. All right. Familiar term or no? Familiar, kind of, not so much. Um, I, I realize this is probably not actually helpful for reading. I don't know how, how visible it is, but um, so incarnation um, simply means to, right, you could break it into its parts, in, and then carnate, right, talking about flesh, right, so God taking on human flesh, right, that's the, the, what the term incarnation means, but we'll We'll give you a little bit of philosophical background here because it's again it's really helpful and it helps us to understand what it is we believe. So, and this actually works out really well. I don't have to do more philosophy. I'm going to use the same terms I already gave you. <laughs> so, God the Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity. Um, maybe we should do a little Father, Son, Holy Spirit diagram up here. Um, God the Son is one of the three persons of the Holy Trinity, right? and he has the divine nature. Right? Um, and he has from all eternity. Now, in his goodness, in a particular moment of time, so as to save us, the second person of the Trinity took on also a human nature. He right? took on, became one of us. Right? So, um, we, obviously, this is we we hear this all the time, right? God became man. But what we're saying specifically is that one person, God the Son, um, took on a second nature, human nature. Um, and so, saying it this way is significant because it it shows a, a few things, right? Um, it's showing that it's specifically the Son, right? God the Son, um, but also that it's not just that he it's not like he just appeared to be man, right? Or was or he was somewhat like man, um, but he really took on a human nature. He really became man. So again, this might be kind of, the difficult questions are very much welcome here, but again, there's not that logical necessity of one person, one nature. Um, for us, obviously, we're limited, but God, who is infinite in power, can take another nature into himself. Right? Um, so the second person of the Trinity, the Son, keeps the divine nature, that doesn't change, he, he doesn't lose that, because um, he's God, but he, in his goodness, takes on a human nature and unites those two in his one person. Um, any questions on that? It's kind of a mess. <laughs> um, but what's so amazing about that is, if we think about the fall, right, if we think about that, since the time, since Adam and Eve's fall, we've been, or humanity was, distanced from God, right? They've fallen from grace. They are separated from him. And here you have God uniting a human nature to his divinity. And so because of that, <laughs> um, it's, it's really foreshadowing what he wants to do in every single individual one of us. Right? He wants to take our individual humanity and unite it to him, to his, to his Godhead, right? to his divinity, in that relationship of love that we were talking about. Um, but we see it all foreshadowed in Christ becoming man. God and man united in this really intense union. Um, so one other, I'll throw out, sorry, there's been a lot of terms, but I'll put out one other because I think it's good to know. Um, so you've maybe heard this phrase before, is the hypostatic union. It's really technical. <laughs> um, hypostatic union is referring to that union of the divine nature and the human nature in the second person of the Trinity. Um, and the helpful thing here is the word hypostatic is just the Greek word for person. So in the one person of the Son, these two natures are united. So it's a hypostatic human. Um, 
And it's from that union of the two person, sorry, oh, there's a heresy, the two, two natures in the one person, right, um, that grace then can flow into us, right, and that we are then able to be united to God. So the hypostatic union is huge. It's how, it's how we're brought back to God. Um, that's a lot all at once. Do we <laughs> any, any questions or break? Or I like how you led into that, but that's why we bow at that. Yeah, that's, so that's that's why we bow, and, and yeah, it's it's um, yeah, that's yeah, because every, everything changed at this moment, right? We think we celebrate Christmas. Christmas is huge; it's a big holiday. Um, but also, one of the things that Catholics have retained that some of the other Protestant denominations don't do is that we celebrate coming up just next or two weeks from now. Um, the Annunciation, right? The moment the angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary and asked her if she would, um, right, say yes to God's plan and bear his son, right, to allow this to happen inside of her. Um, so the feast, this great solemnity of the Annunciation is celebrating this amazing moment when God became a human being, right? The, con the conception of Jesus Christ in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Um, so, We'll dive in just a little bit deeper, because um, again, the wording of the creed really teaches us a lot here. Um, so, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. That again, shows us the reason why this has happened is it's all for us, right? God wants to reconcile us to himself. He wants us to, have, to, to really to inherit heaven, so that's why he's doing this. Um, and this next line really sums up everything beautifully. And by the Holy Spirit, was incarnate of the Virgin Mary. So we see both parts that we have to hold, right? Um, by the work of the Holy Spirit, that's pointing to the divine, all right? By the Holy Spirit, and of the Virgin Mary is pointing to the human. So that's the, the balance we always have to hold when we're talking about Jesus Christ, right? Perfectly God and perfectly man. Um, if we lose one of those two sides, then we're no longer holding to Catholic truth, right? <laughs> um, He's fully God and fully man, uh, by the Holy Spirit, fully God, but truly of the flesh of the Virgin Mary, fully man. Um, I think that that covers, so I guess just one other thing we don't want to say, it can, I mean, it might be easier to think, oh yeah, God became, you might have like a Hercules idea, right? God becoming man, meaning that God the Son became like, uh, God the Son is somewhere in between human beings and God, but that's not really what we're affirming, right? It's that perfect God has chosen to unite a human nature to himself. So remaining perfect God also is a true human being. So, okay, great. Questions from this side of the room, too? Not about this. Not about this, okay. <laughs> I just want to know why this Ukraine war is making all this... We've had war after war, and yeah. nothing happened. And now we get this war, and the whole world's going to hell in the hand. Yeah, we've got lots of reason to pray. Absolutely. Yeah, we can talk more about that after class, too. I'd be happy to. And once they get that. busy with the nukes, we'll all be over. Well, we, we're certainly going to pray that doesn't happen either. Um, but we can talk more after class, too. Um, to push forward just a few last things, we might even get done a little bit early, which. There might there'd be much rejoicing at that, I bet. <laughs> um, so, a few, yeah, some, again, there's, there's so much here. Particularly, if we move down a little farther, we have the sequence that Daniel pointed out. Um, after we speak of his becoming man, um, we have kind of this tracing out of his life, right? For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death, and was buried rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So those four things there, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and then late, then down two lines, his ascension, he ascended into heaven. Um, we lump those four together with the term Paschal Mystery, um, which, so Paschal Easter, right, Easter Mystery, um, which, yeah, really, the reason um, we see this so explicitly talked about here is, again, this is, this is hard for me to not just teach for this on an hour, um, but everything is contained there. 
So there we see Christ's work to save us, right? That he, um, through his death and resurrection, he's bringing us back to, to God, right? So one of the things, yeah, I guess I'm going to take a step back because I think it's really important um, to just say something about why, why it was necessary for God to become man. Um, so again, we think back to the fall. Um, here you have human beings radically rejecting God. God giving, creating us and giving us every good gift, um, really exalting Adam and Eve to a, a quite a lofty state, um, but then, then rebelling against him, saying that we don't want, rejecting his law, rejecting the, the one commandment he gave them, turning away from him, right? Um, and so we have the original sin, which is, is massive in that um, they had every reason to love God, <laughs> and they chose to, to rebel against him, right? Um, so because of that, there's this, there's this um, negative, all these negative consequences from sin, um, and just punishment due to the negative thing that they've done, right, to rebel against him. Um, but God wants to, to bring us back to him, right? So the punishment of sin is separation from, from God. They chose, they said, we want to be separate, and so that's the, that's the punishment. Um, but God doesn't, <laughs> on his end, he doesn't want us to be separate from him. Um, but he also respects the order of justice, right? He doesn't want to, um, right? He, he wants to preserve a word, world where things are well-ordered, right? Where, where justice exists. Um, so he's, there's this dilemma, right? We've got this huge debt from man rebelling against God who's perfectly good. They've said no to the perfect good, so um, there's an infinite debt um, that is so big that we could never make up for it ourselves. We could never repay this um, infinite debt. And so, in his goodness, he um, sees <laughs> that the only thing that can solve this problem is if you have God and man united in one person. Right? Um, you need that human being to be able to do something meritorious, something um, that can win a reward, right? Because God, <laughs> um, God being perfect can't do anything that deserves reward, right? That's proper to us who are in this state of trial, right? Um, so only a human being can win a reward, right? But only God um, is infinite enough to be able to do something so massive to make up that for that debt that we had in sin. So God, in His wisdom, becomes man, becomes uh, takes on a human nature, so as to do something so um, so good to make up for that infinite lack that we had from sin. Um, and so that's specifically, the, I think, the best way to look at why Christ died, too, right? That we can uh, perhaps be confused by this. Why, you know, why such cruelty? Why such gruesomeness? This is, you know, um, but really, if we look at it, it's, it's the ultimate act of love, right? God offering himself um, to save us men, right? And, and because he, so... <laughs> A perfect being, <laughs> right, who deserves absolute honor and praise, choosing the worst of treatments out of love for us. So we see he's, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, <laughs> it's beyond words, right, how good of a thing is being done, right, that he's, um, and because it's so amazingly good, it's deserving of the greatest of rewards, right, for him to so humble himself and to so subject himself to so much for our sake. Um, wins this great reward for the whole human race, right? Um, and so when we're baptized, when we receive the sacraments, what we're participating in is that amazing reward that Christ won in his becoming man, in his death, in his suffering. Um, we're sharing in the gifts that he won by his, his victory there, right? His, his gift of self. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think we maybe sometimes miss that, you know, why was his death necessary? It's him offering himself to God in praise of God, um, wanting to, to give us a share in what we lost. Um, does that, that make sense? Kind of a few inquisitive looks. Um, yes. Linda. I've thought of that so many times and you've explained it very well, but one other thing, God being God, did Jesus have to suffer like that? 
You know, I, yeah. I don't I don't understand why God could not have just erased everything, mm -hmm. all the bad. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great it's a that is a great question. Um, and so here, what we the one of the things we we'll want to keep in mind is we'll we'll talk about um, God is perfect and can is is all powerful, right? Um, so he could have just you know <laughs> said, all right, it's you know it's, everyone we're all good, everything's fine, right? Um, but we can speak about what's most fitting. Um, so even though we can't say you know strictly God had to do it this way, we can talk about what is most fitting given what we know given God's goodness, right? Uh, and so, we see that although it's unimaginable for us, right, to, like, we, we wish, um, because we love God, we don't wish this on him, right? Um, we actually see that it increases his glory more in doing what he did, right? So one, it, it shows his goodness more clearly. Um, if he didn't die in this way, we wouldn't be as aware of the immensity of his love, right? If it was just, oh, the debt's canceled, right? Um, but, and and St. Paul even says this, he, God shows his love in that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Right? So really, that, I think that's the best way of looking at it is, yes, it, it's horrible and it's gruesome, um, but it's, it's the way that God's able to display his boundless love for the human race particularly in what's ugly and gruesome, right? And taking and saying yes to that out of love. Um, does that does that help? Yeah, I've been praying the seven sorrows of Mary and and you know meditating on on what she went through mm. with his suffering and that's why I thought of it. You yeah, know. yeah, no, it's it's a great question. <laughs> it's a good it's a very good question. Well, That's approach, a good answer. So yeah, I mean, another approach would be to say it's for, for our benefit. We weren't allergic to anything. If our debt is so just canceled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yes, and, and like imagine just like like you could write the bad checks on a bank all the time and <laughs> just forgive them. Exactly, and and not only is it um, more than just us learning the lesson, but just like his love is more shown um, through God, um, not just saying okay, everything's canceled, but through loving us in this way, um, he gives us the opportunity to then also love in this way, right? I mean, if he just said, all right, ever since canceled, everyone's <laughs> everyone's perfected, right? Um, that actually isn't as great of a glory as it is to live the Christian life, right? To suffer heroically, right? To, to give one's life for the sake of God and, for the, and out of love for others um, really is a much more beautiful and marvelous way of living than just Oh, <laughs> things went bad. You know, they're not bad anymore. But he wants us to participate in that, right? He wants us to um, become like him in his in his love. So he he gives us the chance to love in the same way. Um, and so, just one other thing about right, God's becoming man and dying for us, um, the Paschal mystery, like we said. Um, like two other things about this. So one in our baptism. Um, what happened to Christ in his death and resurrection happens to us through our, our baptism, which we received, right? So just as Christ died and then was raised to new life, so when we're baptized, it's, it's a, it's a, this is a mystery, and it's hard to understand, but we actually um, become part of Christ in our baptism, and so in becoming part of him, part of his body, right? We've heard this language of the body of Christ as the church. So baptism makes us part of his body, which means we share in his death. And we share in his death insofar as sin in us dies through our baptism, right? Mortal sin, or original sin canceled. And we share in his resurrection in that divine life, grace is poured into our soul. So that's why, you know, yeah, all of this is connected, right? We have baptism, makes us part of Christ, which is our death to sin, just as he died in the flesh and our life to God just as he rose and ascended into heaven. So, and it's for this reason that um, his death, his burial, his resurrection is the center point of our whole year, right? Holy Week and Easter. Um, and more than that, throughout the whole year we meditate on all the different things Christ did throughout his life um, because all of them are done with this goal in mind um, to, to save us. To, for us to share in what he's already done, right? So just like 
in his death and resurrection, we share in through our baptism. And I, I continue to share in that insofar as I say no to sin and say yes to God. I'm living in me Christ's death and his resurrection. Um, and so just like that with death and resurrection, with all of the mysteries of Christ's life, everything he did while on earth as a man, they um, are lived again in the life of the Christian. Um, and that's why we meditate on them throughout the whole year. And, yeah, they're lived again in us, and they're examples of how to live for us. So we can look to the cross, we can look to Christ's teaching, and we can look to his um, hidden life in Nazareth as examples of how to live for how we ought to live. Yes, one, one thought to add to that question, too. Um, St. Bonaventure, a contemporary of St. Thomas Aquinas, also pondered the question of, had humanity not fallen, would Jesus still have come and did what he did? Right. So he even flipped to, like, had, had he not had to repair the fall, and his answer to that was, yes, God would have still done that in order to show the depth of his love. Right? Like, so, so to show, like, everything that Dan just said, I think, sums up, like, a sentence to sum that up is to show the depth of his love. And, and to ponder maybe even, like, had, had the fall not happened, Bonaventure proposes, yes, God still would have gone through that, would have done that in order to show his love for us. Yeah. I didn't have to get through that part. Which saint was the one who dug, was next to the sea and uh, the little boy was digging a... Was that a or was that a yeah. So the one with the, the that's, that, that's how we can't really understand, yeah. I mean, you know, to put the ocean, the sea into that. Yeah. That's how... That's what we do when we talk about God. That's how he brained we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that was to Aquinas? I guess. I guess. I guess, yeah. Okay. I just have a few more kind of other notable small points from the creed. Um, before I kind of do those concluding things, any questions? You know, I just noticed the Nicene Creed doesn't have anything about the communion of saints in it. Yes, that's it. That, I'm not, that's correct. I'm going to get to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it is, it is, so in the Apostles' Creed, we have, yeah, the communion of saints, but we'll get there. Um, so a few other things, very briefly. Uh, fourth paragraph, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord. So just to note that word, Lord, again. Um, so again, we're seeing an equality between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, a couple other things that might not be clear when we just read them. Um, so the giver of life refers to both the Holy Spirit's work in creation, um, the Holy Spirit being present in creation, as well as the Holy Spirit infusing grace into our souls. Right. So giver of life, we can take both ways. Um, so... One other, I guess, one other broad note about the creed, that, or two, so we'll, um, at every baptism, the creed will be said, right? Um, because, think about, as we're entering into divine life, first we have to profess, right? First we have to know God, and then begin to love him, right, and live his life. So that's why we see the creed at the right of baptism, and why we um, say it before we know our baptismal promises. Um, but then also, we say the Nicene Creed every Sunday, <laughs> which may be sometimes like, oh man, this is long, it's a long time to stand, and um, why are we doing this, right? So hopefully this class has already been helpful in seeing why we do it. Um, but just a few other things for your reflection to think about. This is, it's actually an act of worship, right? We can maybe think, oh, this is just something we're reciting. Um, but when we look at everything that God has showed us about himself through this these few paragraphs, um, our reaction when we read it ought to be praise, right? To be, wow, this is <laughs> this is amazing, right? To think about the, the life of the Trinity, the incarnation, Christ, God saving us, um, the church, right? That, you know, maybe not everyone in the pew gets this, and we can't, you know, I miss it all the time too. But yeah, just to pose to you to think of this as um, a chance to give God thanks for him revealing himself. Because he didn't, he didn't have to, he didn't have to reveal himself to us, right? He chose to, and he's goodness, so we should offer him thanks. It a while ago that when we were reading the, the creed about Mass, we're basically reciting a prayer, so I like mm -hmm. to cross myself like sometime at the end. Yes, that's great. That, it's, that's good practice. Um, one other, okay, a few other notes. So, 
we'll kind of bring it to a conclusion here. So yeah, there's a slight difference. We go to the fourth paragraph, um, the fifth. So particularly the fifth in the Apostles' Creed, it reads, um, I believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and resurrection. And the resurrection. Resurrection body. Amen. Um, so the reason I'm not exactly certain for why the change, um, but nothing is lost because the communion of saints is the church, right? So we see if you look at that line beginning of the fifth paragraph, like the, church. Right, the one holy Catholic apostolic church. So that's not lost there. Um, and actually, one other point on that, I remember probably the first time I ever looked at the creed, uh, or like someone I was in a little like. Bible study class as a kid, and they were kind of teaching us some things about the, the creed, and I remember being so confused, why is there nothing about the Eucharist in the creed? In the creed? Isn't that kind of a big thing? Um, and yeah, so I think it's important just to make one note about the sacraments, because there are some Christians who would say, oh yeah, I, I believe in the Nicene Creed, but then they would reject the sacraments, right? Um, so from some of our Protestant brothers and sisters. Um, so obviously baptism is mentioned explicitly, that's one of our seven sacraments. Um, but we could, we could also say, just insofar as it's uh, professing belief in the church, right, included in that is the sacraments, um, because it's the sacraments that make the church. Um, so the sacraments are here, it's just kind of um, in an implicit way, and that's actually points to the fact that when this was written in 325, Nobody was questioning the sacraments, right? Everyone's like, oh yeah, baptism, communion, right? These are, you have to have these, right? And reconciliation. Um, because they weren't questioned, they didn't need to be defined. Um, so if we look at later creeds that come from later Catholic councils, we'll see definitions of the sacraments. But they weren't questioned early on, so we don't see them um, clearly spelled out. Uh, and then just one final note and a way to conclude. Um, you'll see that the last line is that we believe in the life of the world to come. Um, and just, yeah, one other thought for a reflection that that's a really, the best way to end it, and the best way for us to end our class today is on the reflection of eternity, to remember that God's calling us to himself. He wants us to, to be with him forever, in heaven, loving him. Um, and so as we, every time we say it, we should leave with that thought, to think about heaven, which is our home that we're made for, um, and I hope as we all go our different ways tonight, we can be thinking of thinking of God at heaven as well. So let's pray together and then class ended somewhat early. So, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Very good. Thank you.